This message was delivered at Westminster Presbyterian in Bartlesville, Oklahoma on January 28, 2024. The speaker is Mr. James Hyder, a ruling elder. The message is based upon Hebrews chapter 7, verses 20 through 28, and it is titled, The Better Priest Part 2. Now if perfection had been attainable through the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need would there have been for another priest to arise after the order of Melchizedek, rather than one named after the order of Aaron? For when there is a change in the priesthood, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. For the one of whom these things are spoken belonged to another tribe, from which no one has ever served at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, and in connection with that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. This becomes even more evident when another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not on the basis of a legal requirement concerning bodily descent, but by the power of an indestructible life. For it is witnessed of him, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For on the one hand, a former commandment is set aside because of its weakness and uselessness. For the law made nothing perfect. But on the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And it was not without an oath. For those who were formerly priests became, were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. This makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily for his own sins and then for those of the people, since he did this once for all, and he offered up himself. For the law appoints men in their weakness as high priests, but the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The author of the book of Hebrews really likes to talk about priests. He first mentioned priests way back in chapter 2. In chapter 3, he exhorted us to consider our great high priest, to let our hearts and our thoughts dwell upon our Savior's priesthood. And the author took his own advice, returning to the topic again and again. In chapters 4 and 5, we are pointed to the priesthood of Christ, yet again as the foundation of truth for endurance, when it says, Since then, because we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. On account of that, let us hold fast our confession. And then, elaborating on the great benefits for the believer in having a priest who is like us and knows what we are going through in this fallen world. Again, chapter 6 reaches its culmination with this beautiful statement. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place beyond, behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The priesthood of Christ is not an abstract theological truth to know, acknowledge, and then put on a shelf. It is a truth revealed for the purpose of encouraging us, strengthening us, filling us with joy and confidence in our God and Savior. And yet, even after everything that I just said, the author of Hebrews is not done 
talking about the priesthood of Christ. There is yet more depth and yet more that must be said. In chapter 7, we are shown the superiority of Christ's priesthood over the old covenant system of Levitical priests so that we and the original audience might realize the singular significance of Christ for the people of God. He is a priest like the priests of old, and yet very much unlike the priests of old in some key ways. And yet, even there, every difference is not simply a difference, but an improvement. Christ's priesthood is better in every way. Our priest is a better priest. His covenant is a better covenant. And that is where we find ourselves this morning. The better priest, part two. We will be covering verses 20 through 28 in three parts. The better covenant, the better priesthood, and the only savior. Again, that's the better covenant, the better priesthood, and the only savior. First, the better covenant. After speaking about the differences between Christ and the Levitical priesthood, the different basis of Christ's priesthood and the changes to the law that were required as a result, the author makes this point. And it was not without an oath. For those who formerly became priests were made such without an oath. But this one was made a priest with an oath by the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. Matthew Henry explains the significance of this point concisely. He says, there is a change in the way of God's acting in this priesthood. He has taken an oath to Christ, which he never did to any in the order of Aaron. God never gave them any such assurance of their continuance. He never engaged himself by oath or promise that theirs should be an everlasting priesthood. And therefore, he gave them no reason to expect the perpetuity of it, but rather to look upon it as a temporary law. But Christ was made a priest with the oath of God. Here God has upon oath declared the immutability, excellency, efficacy, and eternity of Christ's priesthood. God promised by oath that the priesthood of Christ would endure. He never promised that to the sons of Aaron. Precisely because the Aaronic priesthood would not endure forever. It was always intended by God to be a temporary, transitory, caretaker organization for his people. They served a purpose for a time. And then it was always God's intention that they should be replaced. The same cannot be said about Christ. Though his, life, his human life on earth was brief, and his remaining with his disciples after his resurrection was even briefer still, he lives even now and serves even now as our great high priest. This service is on the basis of the power of his indestructible life, but it is also on the basis of this oath that God has sworn. It is, to hearken back to the arguments of Hebrews chapter 6, doubly guaranteed. It is something that rests on the solid foundation of God's oath and on the solid foundation of God's perfect, of Christ's perfect righteousness. This new covenant in Christ's blood is not a handshake deal. It is not an oral agreement subject to frail human memory and even more frail human morality. This is a signed, certified, notarized, triply printed, safe, official, formal covenant document. Which has more weight? An IOU written hastily on the back of a napkin or a dollar that says backed by the full faith and credit of the United States government? The new covenant is backed by the full faith and credit of our triune God. 
This new covenant is stamped with his authority via his oath and then sealed with Christ's blood. And it is on that basis that the author continues saying, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. This covenant was promised by oath and established by Christ's righteousness and sacrifice. We will get into more detail on the better covenant in chapter 8, but for now I want to point your attention back to our related scripture reading in Ezekiel 36. What should have struck you about Ezekiel 36 is that God himself is the actor. He is telling his people what he will do for them. Here are just a few selections. I am about to act. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name. I will take you from the nations. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and your idols. I will cleanse you from. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my To reframe all of that, I want you to consider this question. Why does God save us? What motivation does he have to save us? In Ephesians, Paul writes this, But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And the Westminster Shorter Catechism makes a complimentary point when it says, God having out of his mere good pleasure from all eternity elected some to everlasting life, did enter into a covenant of grace to deliver them out of an estate of sin and misery and to bring them into an estate of salvation by a redeemer. To massively oversimplify something that is of no exaggeration of infinite depth, God saved us because he wanted to. Grace is precisely that. It is unearned, unmerited, uncaused by anything in us. The source of our salvation is that God willed it. He elected from eternity past out of his mere good pleasure because in his character, he is rich in mercy and full of great love. He chose freely to save a people to himself to covenant with them and to establish that covenant in the blood of Christ. Because God willed it, it is sure and certain. Nothing that God has ever willed, has ever or could ever fail. Everything that God intends come to pa- comes to pass. And because of that, there was no need for God to swear an oath. There was no need for God to swear an oath except for our comfort, our peace, our reassurance, which goes to the very heart of why and how the new covenant is a better covenant. It is a better covenant because it is so clearly out of our hands. We contribute not one drop, not one mite, not one ounce to our salvation. We do not, we are not required to participate in outward sacrifices and rituals, but rather we are granted the simple truths of the plain gospel and the plain and profound realities of the Lord's Supper and baptism. Everything in the Christian faith points directly to Christ for the very purpose of reminding us that we have nothing to do with it. It points to Christ so that we might know Christ is the one who did it, who established it, and upon whom it depends. We are saved by grace through faith in him. 
But even our faith is a gift from him. It is a gift granted freely, but it is a gift that is founded on this oath and promise so that we know for sure that it will not be taken away from us. As long as this earth stands, the offer of the gospel will stand. And once this earth falls, the blessings of the gospel for his people will endure forever. Though every single thing you have ever seen will one day be destroyed, decay, or be burned with fire, this entire world is transitory, being stored up for destruction. The new covenant is fixed. It is permanent. It is trustworthy. It is written in the blood of our Savior, the blood of our great high priest, who is himself the guarantor. God has sworn and will not change his mind. Our Savior will be a priest forever, with nothing able to change that, no foe able to threaten his authority or our security. No sin of ours can dethrone him in heaven. Glory of glories, our Savior reigns. Which brings us to our second point, the better priest. Again, we have covered or will cover in the future many of the points that could be drawn out of these verses. But since the author of Hebrews is restating them here, I think it's profitable to dwell on his conclusion, why he's restating them here. The former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. The new covenant rests upon the oath of God, but it also rests upon the indestructible life of Christ. His righteous sacrifice on the cross allowed him to be the first fruits of a new creation. We know that he was resurrected unto glory, and because he was resurrected unto glory, his body will never fail. It will never decay or die. Unlike priests in the Old Covenant who were succeeded in office by their sons after a period of years, we have one priest. He has held that office for thousands of years without interruption, and he will continue to hold that office forever into all eternity in the new heavens and the new earth. This is beautiful, and it is helpful for us because the author of Hebrews wants to encourage you even more and ground your faith even more in our glorious Savior. And so he makes this point on the basis of that continuation of the priesthood, saying, Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. We made the point last week that there is no sacrifice that could have been offered by the Levitical priesthood that would have saved man. On account of the sinfulness of the priest, all that could be done in those sacrifices was point forward in hope and in faith to the Savior that was to come, the Savior that would be the true sacrifice. The blood of bulls and lambs can never save men. In stark contrast to that system, we have a once-for-all sacrifice by our great high priest that is effective and effectual for all of his chosen people for all time. And that very same priest continues to this day. Not only is his blood able to save us to the uttermost, to wipe away all of our sins, but that very same Savior is currently and perpetually seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven, making intercession for his people even now. I want to illustrate this for you. But when speaking about our Savior and divine realities, every illustration will pale in comparison to the truth. So bear with me. 
I want you to think about calling a company on the phone. You have some problem that you need solved. How often are we transferred from one department to another, one representative to another, one person to another, handed off to someone who may be better skilled or better authorized to help us with whatever problem that we're having with that company. And with every single transfer, we essentially have to start over. We have to re-explain our problem. Sometimes we even have to re-verify our account, which is ridiculous, but not the point. It's a hassle and it's an annoyance. Now imagine if you had a problem with a company and you were told, here's the owner's number. Call him, he wants to hear from you, he'll solve your problems. If you were told to go directly to the person who is both, who has the knowledge and authority and inclination to help you, how much better would that be? That is what we have in Christ. We have direct access to the very top. We have an open invitation to the throne room of heaven to bring all of our needs to him with the knowledge that he wants us to come, that out of his abundance of love and grace, he will hear us and care for us and provide for us. I quoted this passage last week, but it is equally pertinent today. The call of Jesus to his people is this. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That is not a platitude. That is not merely a future promise. It is a direct invitation to you now to bring the burden of your hearts to Christ, directly to Christ. We do not need a mediator between us and the mediator anymore. Even those offices in the church that endure do not function as go-betweens between God and man. But rather, their main function is to point the elect to their Savior, to remind them of Christ, to teach them about his glories, to pray, for, to pray for and with them, and to correct them when they are wayward. And yet, even church officers do not in, introduce a hierarchy into the faith. There is not a chain that goes you, your pastor, and then God. It's you and God and all of us together. Don't take me the wrong way. I am not arguing in favor of a me and my Bible alone Christianity. The church plays an incredibly important and God-given role for believers. But what I am emphasizing here is that when it comes to salvation and access to God, that is not mediated by anyone except for Christ. We have direct access to God the Father through Christ the Son and the power of the Holy Spirit. Only Christ stands between us and the Father. And he does not stand as a barrier, but as a bridge, inviting us to come in and call God, Abba, Father. Gone are the inner and outer courts. Gone are the curtains and the walls and the threats of death and destruction if you come into the presence of our infinitely holy God. In Christ, on account of his priesthood, we are saved to the uttermost, covered in his blood and righteousness, and invited to come in. Hallelujah. Which brings me to my last point, the only Savior. It was originally titled, The Better Savior, but the only Savior says it more accurately, so I had to drop my alliteration. We have already seen how Christ's permanent, indestructible life and priesthood means that he can apply his blood to his people whenever they call upon him. That he is there even now listening to our prayers and interceding with the Father on our behalf. For it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest. 
holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners and exalted above the heavens. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily for his own sins and then for those of the people. Since he did this once for all when he offered himself up, For the law appoints men in their weakness to serve as high priests. But the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. This may seem like a step down from the lofty heights where we just were. What could be more glorious than salvation to the uttermost? Yet, as we saw when we were looking at the book of Genesis, God does things in an orderly fashion. He did not burst into this world with authority and loud might, separating the sheets, the sheep from the goats by force and putting an end to all things immediately. Rather, the Apostle Peter tells us what the will of God was for this world. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. It is in pursuit of that goal that everything in this world was providentially ordered. First, the sons of Adam called upon the name of the Lord. Then the line of Abraham was called to be a kingdom of priests. And in the fullness of time, Christ came to fulfill the law and replace the old covenant priesthood with himself, as our great high priest. This was good. This was fitting. And undeniably, the end was better than the beginning. The Savior himself is better than the promises of a Savior to come. For our Savior is exactly what we, his people, need. He is like us. He is completely human, knowing our frailties and temptations. And yet, he is completely and fully free of sin. He is innocent, holy, unstained, and thus he has no need whatsoever for continuing sacrifices. Christ's priesthood is not marked by continuing sacrifices because not only does he have no sins that need to be atoned for, but his blood deals with our sins once for all. So that once you are coded, even once, no more sacrifice is necessary. It is done and it is dealt with. Christ offered himself up and that offering was accepted fully and completely. It satisfied the wrath of God against sin for his chosen people. In Christ, God was doing something new something fundamentally different in character and degree from everything that came before him. Because everything that came before him only pointed in eager anticipation to his once for all sacrifice. Christ is not the better savior. Christ is the only savior. Abraham led his people well. He led them out of Ur of the Chaldees, and then he died. Moses, mostly, led his people well. He led them out of Egypt, and then he died. Joshua led his people well. He led them into the promised land, and then he died. David led his people through an era of war into an era of prosperity and peace, and then he died. It is as it was described in the book of Judges. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For the Lord was moved to pity by their groaning because of those who afflicted and oppressed them. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods serving them and bowing down to them. They did not drop any of their practices or their stubborn ways. Brothers and sisters, that is not the promise of the new covenant. That is not the reality of the life 
of the Christian. In Christ, we have the fulfillment of the promise given through Ezekiel, where God says, I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness. And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. Again, not you will cleanse yourself. He will cleanse us. He will give us a new heart and a new spirit. He will remove the heart of stone from our flesh and give us a heart of flesh. He will put his spirit within us and cause us to walk in his statutes and be careful to obey his rules. That is the promise of the new covenant. And we have a down payment of that even now. As believers, we are being made perfect, just as our Savior was made perfect. But the beautiful thing is that this process of perfection doesn't begin in the new heavens and the new earth. It ends in the new heavens and the new earth. It began at the moment of your salvation. Even though we perceive our lives, all of the sins in our lives, all of the weaknesses of our heart, we can look at our hearts and despair of who we are, despair even of being saved by Christ. And yet, the promise of God is that even with all of the backsliding and regaining ground, even with all the forgetfulness and the relearning things that we should have known years ago, even with all the realities of this fallen life, in Christ, our end is perfection. And that promise is guaranteed with an oath. Our great high priest, who bids us come unto him and find rest, serves by the power of his indestructible life and doubly established by the oath of God. This is the very same priest that guarantees our sanctification and our our glorification. Moreover, it is this very same priest who has made this promise to his church. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The one to whom all authority on earth has been given, the one whose priesthood is guaranteed by an oath and doubly guaranteed by his righteous sacrifice, the one who has all authority to make this offer, says to us, Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. What greater comfort and encouragement could there be in this life? None. (laughs) Amen. Let's pray. Father, we do pray that you would be true to your word and be true to your covenant and pour out your blessings of righteousness and zeal after righteousness upon us. Father, we pray that each and every one of us would daily be about the business of putting off the old man and putting on the new. Father, we pray that you would bless us according to your sure and certain word according to your promise, according to the free offer of the gospel. Lord God, as we go into this world, let us be forgetful of ourselves and quick to remember you. Let us be quick to repent and long to dwell on our repentance. Father, we pray that in all things we may glorify you and your holy name more and more day by day as you have promised that we would. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. For more messages like the one you just heard, visit Westminster Presbyterian online or in person at westminsterbartlesville.org or in person at the corner of Adams and Chickasaw in Bartlesville, Oklahoma. We meet every Lord's Day at 10.30 in the morning and 5 p.m. in the evening. We'd be glad to have you.